grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is my first Sunday as your pastor. And it is the start of a new relationship for you and me, that of pastor and congregation. But it is the continuation of a long-established relationship that was begun in Christ and endures in him, that of shepherd and flock. For Christ is our shepherd, yours and mine, and by God's grace I pray that I may serve you in love and humility, patience and understanding, with wisdom and by the word of God, that you may be equipped for every good work and being faithful unto death, receive the crown of eternal life. And since many of you don't know very much about me, I'll tell you a little something. I find in myself a lot of doubting Thomas. I have a real soft spot for this guy because he and I, we're on the same page. I like to be able to touch something, to know that it is real, to have the reassurance of my reason and my senses to confirm that something is true. Yeah, I think Thomas and I would get along really well. Now, have you ever compared yourself to other Christians? Have you ever felt that you were lacking? You didn't love Jesus as much as them. You didn't have as strong a faith. You don't know the Bible like they do. Well, maybe this is how Thomas felt when he came to the other disciples. His brothers, the other disciples, are glad. Nay, actually, they are rejoicing because they have seen the Lord. Well, Thomas might well have thought them delusional mad, overcome by the grief that they're seeing things. And yet they persist in this claim. Now the truth is that those other disciples had really been no better than Thomas. Where were they when Jesus came to him the first time? Well, they were locked in that upper room, locked in that upper room for fear of the Jews. They didn't believe Jesus when he told them about the resurrection before the crucifixion. And they didn't believe the testimony of the women who were the first to see the risen Lord. And yet it's somehow Thomas that we call doubting. But to be more precise, he's not doubting Thomas. It was Thomas who disbelieved. Thomas who disbelieved when he heard the testimony of his brothers. But again, I could see myself saying, like doubting Thomas, unless I see him for myself, I won't believe that he's risen. But Thomas actually goes a step farther. He starts laying down all these criteria. He's not going to be satisfied just to see Jesus. No, he's got to touch him. He's got to put his finger right there in those marks. He's got to put his hand right in the side. Then and only then will Thomas believe. And the truth is that Thomas is closer to the gospel truth than he realized. Recall the words of Christ. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. We only believe when we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. Indeed, we are, all of us, so much like Thomas, and truly so much like the other disciples, You see, they were all wrong not to believe the eyewitness testimony given to them. And when you and I disbelieve, we are wrong. We are wrong to disbelieve the eyewitness testimony that has been recorded for us. You see, faith is not grounded in 
how we feel about Jesus, but it rests upon the sure and certain objective truth of his work. It is an objective truth that goes so much farther than knowledge, so much deeper than fact. This word, this ever-speaking word, spoken from the beginning, is the very fabric of the universe. In him and by his word, we live, we move, we have our very being. We cannot, by our own reason or strength, that of our own, believe in Jesus Christ our Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit calls us by the gospel, enlightens us with his gifts, sanctifies and keeps us in the true faith. And this true faith also is a gift, a gift of the Holy Spirit. It does not depend on you doesn't depend on your passions, your feelings, your reason, or your strength. It depends on God. It does not depend on you. Now, as the epitome of the formula of Concord declares, one of the documents of our confessions to which last week I ascribed, as I was ordained and installed as your pastor, and one of the books in our confession to which you all have ascribed as members of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The epitome declares, a person's will in his conversion is purely passive. That's understood with respect to divine grace in the kindling of the new movements, which is to say, when God's Spirit through the heard word or the use of the sacraments, lays hold of a person's will and works in him the new birth and conversion. Only then, only after the word has worked this conversion, will the will of that person be an instrument and organ of God the Holy Spirit. And after conversion, after new birth, then then we not only accept grace, but we also cooperate with the Holy Spirit in the good works that follow. Only after conversion is worked, by means of His grace, does man's will participate with God. It's never before. Never before conversion. And so those who say that you have to pray the sinner's prayer that you have to ask Jesus into your heart, that you need to make him your Lord and Savior. These dear friends have already experienced the conversion that the Holy Spirit has wrought within them, or else they wouldn't hunger for Jesus. They wouldn't hunger for forgiveness. Because before conversion, our will is set against God. Our will is bound to evil. Our will is bound to rebel we, know, we do not even see sin. We don't recognize it, and we certainly don't ask for forgiveness. But His Word, His Word comes. It shatters our hard hearts and brings forth that new life within, that new life that says, yes, I need a Savior. Yes, I need forgiveness. And that's the conversion that works with the Holy Spirit to do good works that follow after. See, before conversion, we are nothing more than just dry and lifeless bones in the valley, much like those that Ezekiel had seen. But there was a time that these dry and lifeless bones had life, and that time was before the fall, in the beginning when God took the dust of the earth and made man and then breathed into him the breath of life. Not long after, by the trespass of Adam, sin and death entered the world, and then sin corrupted our bodies, and sin corrupted all of creation. But God promised then to renew creation, to restore life. And he told Ezekiel, 
to prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And again God commanded Ezekiel, Prophesy to the breath, breathe on these slain, that they may live. Ezekiel was prophesying of Christ. For in the resurrection of Jesus, we see the beginning of this new life. We see the kingdom of God breaking forth into all creation. And so gathered in that locked room, Jesus breaks forth and appears in the midst of the disciples and says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. And so just as God had once breathed life into Adam, so now he is breathing it on man again. This life, this breath, it's not only for the disciples in the locked room. These disciples are now apostles, and they are the ones being sent into the world with his declaration of peace. And so it was from that small locked room in Jerusalem and throughout all the world and even to this altar here in the middle of El Centro, California, that his peace the peace of Christ comes. It is peace in the free gift of forgiveness that he gives to you. And it is peace that he gives to you in himself, joining himself to you in the sacraments of the water and the blood. For just as Adam's bride was taken forth from his side, so also the bride of Christ is taken from the side where the water and the blood and the Spirit were shed. Believe his testimony. Believe the testimony of the evangelists. Believe the confession of Thomas. For when Christ appeared to Thomas, he once more said to all of them, Peace be with you. And then said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Jesus wasn't visible when Thomas made that bold claim, but Jesus knew exactly the proof that Thomas said he must have. And yet at Christ's command, what is it that, G that Thomas says? Christ says, do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. May this be your confession as well. My Lord and my God. Let your desire be for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up in salvation. Drink deeply of this. Immerse yourself in the Word. Study it daily. Be faithful in receiving the sacraments. Live in the forgiveness of sins. Sincerely forgive and do good to those who sin against you. Yea, seven times, seventy times even. And do not disbelieve, but believe. For we have the greater testimony, and it was written for you. Hear now the word. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, are your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Let us now offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving, a sacrifice of the lips confessing his name. But to do good and to distribute forget not, for with such things God is well pleased. 